Uh, my name is Tyler Sigmund. I'm the co-founder and design director for Red Hook Studios. We make a game called Darkest Dungeon. And I think the, uh, the best way to introduce the game, if you're not familiar with it, is to show a little video. Um, before I show the video, this is the screen that we show at the beginning of the game uh, every time you boot it up. And we try to remind people of what we're trying to do with Darkest Dungeon. And one of the biggest things there you'll see in the description is that uh, it's a little different from many RPGs in that uh, failure is meant to be kind of part of the experience. And it really is about making the best of a bad situation. That's that first line, and that um, I'll talk about that a little more. But first, a video. Uh, warning, there's a little profanity in here. <clears throat> Survival is a tenuous proposition. That's okay, come on, healer. Sprawling too. Come on! boss has like one hit point right now. I can't say that's exactly what we were trying to do, but I, w <laughs> but I will say we were trying to go for uh, emotional engagement, and, and I think we succeeded. <laughs> and to, to rewind just a little bit, uh, we have, are big fans of RPGs and have been gaming you know, a long time, as probably all of us since we were little kids, and um, a lot of RPGs, I feel like, put you in that role of being the hero, and they expect you to succeed, and they expect you to be a force of good in this world of evil. And we felt like something that had been lost along the, the way with many RPGs is that the focus had shifted from uh, really what makes up a hero into how big are their shoulder pads, um, you know, how, how purple are their equipment and that sort of thing, and we, f we felt that something that had been lost was, what about the constitution or the makeup of the hero themselves? And so we were inspired not so much by, uh, I mean, we were inspired by other games for sure, but we were inspired by human tales, human stories. Um, so this, this is a character from Band of Brothers, which is you know a, a dramatization that HBO did about uh, World War II, and uh, I picked him because he's he's a very gregarious, outgoing, charming, you know, handsome character that that really is kind of the life of the squad. And uh, and then there's one kind of pivotal episode where he he's forced to watch some of his friends die, and, and you know it just really breaks him. And I think it's a very powerful scene acted by this this actor, and that that shows like the the range of the human experience um, or aliens. You know, if, if you've seen that where uh, Hudson is the trained, you know, he's full of bravado, he's full of, full of lots, uh, uh, sorry about that, just adjusting so I maybe don't uh, spin into it as much. He's full of bravado, you know, until they actually get in combat and then he panic, he's one of the first to panic. Um, and then oddly enough, you know, Ripley, played by Sigourney Weaver, uh, is a civilian, but she's made of the sterner, sternest stuff possible. And... 
again, in the thing, uh, there's you know, kind of a lot of human elements there where suspicion and people start to panic and, and just break down. And we felt like that could be a really powerful uh, thing to consider in a classic ta uh, tactical turn-based fantasy RPG. So like I mentioned, our goal really from the beginning was emotional engagement. We wanted, there, there's a few reasons why that, that was important to us. Um, as, as, you know, we wanted our game to succeed, so we felt a little bit that there were so many great RPGs out there that uh, if we didn't bring something new, um, then kind of what was, the, what was the point of making it? And we were also a very, very small team, so we knew we weren't going to be able to compete with The Witcher or, you know, we weren't going to be able to out Diablo Diablo and that sort of thing. So it's a crowded space, and it's been an evergreen genre. I mean, I think fan, you know, computer RPGs are one of the oldest computer game genres, period. You know, maybe only preceded by Space War or Pong or something like that. Um, and really, we, we wanted to make the game about uncomfortable decisions. And specifically, that means it should never be perfect, because li life really isn't perfect. And, uh, you know, there, there's such a difference between theory and practice, and I think... Uh, there's some great quotes from, you know, I think it's a Mike Tyson quote, which I, I don't know what you, th Mike Tyson is a, is a whole other subject which we won't cover, but, um, you know, everyone has a plan until they get hit, you know, and I think, um, or there, there's another quote, I forgot who it's attributed to, of, you know, everyone has a strategy until first contact with the enemy, because all of a sudden things are not perfect anymore. Now, you know, whatever you had practiced, whatever you had planned is has to be adjusted, and we thought that that would be a really interesting way to look at RPGs. And like I said earlier, we wanted to make it about the sword arm, not the sword. So equipment, you know, right from the beginning was going to be a much smaller piece of the game than, say, would be what, it, what are the particular traits of the hero. And we knew in doing that, I mean, the way we pitch the game is it's a, it's a turn-based gothic horror RPG all about the psychological stress of adventuring which is kind of a mouthful and also probably not the broadest appealing, you know, psychological stress of adventure. Okay, it's, we're, we're not going to match the Candy Crush demographic. We're not going to be, um, or even for that matter, Clash of Clans or something like that that might have a fantasy theme but is, is enormously broadly appealing. And that means, you know, if you, we felt if you try to appeal to everyone, you might end up appealing to nobody because it, it might end up being really just kind of lukewarm or lack lack really strong creative vision. I think for every game that does appeal to, you know, zillions of people, um, there is a lot that are just kind of left by the wayside of just not, not being interesting. Out of curiosity, how many of you have heard about Darkest Dungeon before I, I shut up? Okay. About, yeah, about half the room maybe. Um, and we started with the idea before we formed the company. We were working at other companies, and uh, I'd been with another indie developer, and my business partner and artist, uh, Chris, he had been at other, he was doing concept art, freelance, and things like that. So we, we had the benefit of being able to think about the game quite a bit before we decided to get together and make it. And uh, I think that was really, really helpful for Darkest Dungeon, because Essentially, we, we knew exactly what we wanted to make before we really got into it. And I think there's a lot of talk about iteration, uh, iterative game design, which I think is another path that is really valid, uh, where you kind of just may be inspired by one thing, and then you see where it goes, and you end up making something completely different. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I think in this case, for us, uh, it was really, really critical and very helpful throughout development that we, we knew that pillar, you know, that emotional engagement pillar um, that we would come back to. Because, you know, you're making something and it's very easy to get kind of interested of a sub part of what you're doing and then you end up down a different rabbit hole. But every time that we w started working on a feature, you know, we would say, well, is this actually enhancing um, the core game that we wanted to make? So we, we never actually prototyped a, a completely functional version of the game before we started development. And I'm usually a, a huge fan of prototyping, but we did a lot of visual prototyping, a lot of talking back and forth, um, a lot of drinking and whiskey, which you know always makes you feel like your ideas are the best uh, at the time. But then afterwards, it's nice to look back and, and see if any of it made sense. And so over, over time, we were able to kind of cull down to the, the core of what the game was. And we realized that there were kind of four parts that needed to work harmoniously uh, together. And that was combat, which is really where people will spend the majority of their time. Um, and it's linked together via exploration, which is just our term for going through the dungeons. 
Um, and it was important that we, we kind of elevated combat above the exploration just because I think um, that, that led to, you know, there are hard decisions about where to use your resources. And for us, you know, we knew combat was, was critical. Camping was kind of an idea we had from the beginning, I think, just because uh, we felt that maybe a lot, of, a lot of the adventuring lifestyle might be what are you doing around the campfire, what are you doing, and then in town, which, which is a really critical part of the game. Uh, if any of you have played like pen and paper RPGs like Dungeons and Dragons or things like that, you know that some of the best moments come not from rolling the dice but from the role playing or the sitting around and figuring out you know, what, what makes each character tick. And that, that was something we were trying to bring into uh, Darkest Dungeon. So as a result, um, we ended up with a game with a lot of systems. There was those four uh, key, key pillars, but around that are like a zillion things. Um, one, of the, one of the problems of making an RPG about the psychological stress of adventuring is that you also have to just make an RPG period, which by necessity comes with a million you know, different things like leveling up, uh, some amount of items, you know, monsters, quests, all these sorts of things. So I think one of the neat things about Dark's Dungeon is we've got all those zillions of systems, but then we also have you know, the, the affliction system, which I'll talk a little bit about, which is what kind of makes the game unique. Um, but from a design standpoint, it's challenging because, you know, I felt we were a very small team. It was me as the, the only designer for a lot of the game, um, but my, my, uh, the creative director, my business partner, he, he and I would work out kind of the high-level stuff together, and then I'm like the spreadsheet guy, so then I go into that. But you can't spend all your time on any one thing because you've got to do everything. So it, it becomes extremely important what you leave out, and I think that... Uh, you know, it's maybe like editing if you're a writer. Uh, I think Stephen King has developed a rule over time where he writes the first draft and then he takes out like 30% of the words. <laughs> it just works for him. Uh, it, it's become almost arbitrary. He just will take out 30% of the words. It's not quite so simple maybe in game design, but you do need to make choices of what to leave out. So for us, um, leaving out Oh, there were so many times we talked about crafting. Well, you know, let's just slip a crafting system in there. Like, you can just slip a crafting system in there. Um, dialogue trees, I mean, it's an RPG, so it would be really interesting to have, you know, dialogue, and, and the quest should have, like, in-detail write-ups and all those things. We ended up doing none of that. And actually, it, it made the game, it made the narration, or made the experience, the story experience of the game, much more powerful than if we had actually crafted it all. Uh, because we rely on emergent experience. So one thing we didn't do is like heavy lore. So instead of, you know, you're fighting in the realm of Kazakhstan and whatever and fighting this and that and, you know, kind of like the Tolkien approach to proper names for everything. I remember, uh, I don't know if you played Kingdoms of Amalur a, f a few years ago or maybe 10 years ago. I don't know. Time is moving fast. Uh, it was just full of so many proper names that it just becomes like soup, you know. And unless you really want to get into the lore, it's kind of interesting just to deal with archetypes. So in Darkest Dungeon, we have the hamlet instead of like the town of whatever, you know, it's just the hamlet. And then you quest in the ruins and the warrens and the cove and, you know, the, the, you, you treat your people at the abbey. And it was kind of interesting because it was a bit of a risk at the time. We were worried maybe people wouldn't get into it, but we felt like by dealing in those kind of archetypes that it could work. So that saved us so much work. I mean, these are just four little boxes, but these could have taken over the whole game or required us to take another year of development or hire three more people or any, any, anything like that. So instead, we tried to focus our energy on the things that would really make the game unique. So for us, it's this affliction system. And that's just our name for, uh, I guess the, the unique hook of Darkest Dungeon is that your heroes, as they adventure, they, they get stressed out. So it turns out being an adventurer is, is a pretty shitty job. Uh, if you think about it, it's, it's kind of like being a soldier. I mean, you, you uh, except for maybe even worse because the pay is uncertain. Um, so, you know, you're, you're going down into dungeons, you're fighting skeletons, you're running out of food, you may die at any moment, and all in quest for, I don't know, notoriety or maybe a little bit of gold. And sometimes you go on these quests and it doesn't work out. So uh, the other thing that's very similar to is being an indie developer. <laughs> so... So in our game, uh, your characters get stressed out, and then uh, if you keep using them over and over and over, they'll just cease to be productive, basically. Um, so there's events and situations that will cause them stress. Uh, so this little guy with the cup, 
is kind of fun. He's one of our monsters, and he throws a random a liquid, like a black liquid on you, which we don't know what it is, um, which is stressful. I mean, if someone came up to you and threw a goblet of liquid on you, I would be stressed out. Uh, and it's called Tempting Goblet, which, I don't know, is, is the, the move name. So you get stressed out, or yes, there's items in the game that you may open a bookcase and read something and just challenges your worldview, and that stresses you out. We were very inspired by H.P. Uh, Lovecraft and kind of the, the psychological horror genre of, of like, maybe mankind is not at the top of the pecking order, and maybe there's these forces and monsters lurking that you know, we don't always see, and that's pretty stressful. So we tried to play that up a lot. As your stress builds, um, you can't see it in the screenshot here, but we actually have a stress meter. And as your stress builds, when it reaches 100, we have what's called a resolve check, which is basically a moment of, you know, are you going to become heroic or something else? So hopefully you will become heroic with what we call a virtue. And uh, so courageous is one of our virtues. So this is, you know, all of a sudden you'll have buffs or be able to do things that you couldn't do before. But more often than not, uh, you become afflicted. So uh, paranoia is one of the afflictions. And this is, this is one of our classes, the, the leper. We have some really weird character classes. Uh, so he has a mask normally, and uh, when he gets afflicted, he just takes his mask off. That's what you're seeing there. <clears throat> so we have seven afflictions in the game. There's paranoia, um, hopelessness, fear, gosh, masochism, abusiveness, irrationality, I feel like I'm, oh, and selfishness. You know, all those wonderful parts of, of, of humanity. And, uh, <laughs> and these all manifest in different ways. So if, if your character becomes selfish, they may actually steal treasure for themselves. Uh, they may decide to move themselves out of harm's way uh, during a combat in efforts to make sure that they live another day. Um, if they become abusive and one of their fellow party members misses, they may verbally berate them like, why did I go on this adventure with you? You can't hit shit. You're a useless piece of crap. That kind of thing, you know. So it's junior high school, basically. Um, and the important thing is they're all tied into game mechanics, but we also tie them into uh, the, the characters will speak. And it's pretty small here, but you'll see, like, uh, this. I think the leper at the top left has become masochistic and wants to... Oh, no, it's the hellion, sorry. Um, it wants to take damage. So if someone's masochistic, they may actually leap to the front and be like, you know, purge me, sort of thing. Um, it's really dark at times. And yeah, I think the highwayman is being abusive. He's calling his fellows weaklings here. Um, I, I can't even read that, and it's, it's giant. But yeah, I like someone did fan art, and that's basically what's happening in the game. But so this is a way we pay off. Uh, we wanted to enforce that your, your heroes are their own little people, that you may tell them what to do. You're kind of the coach or the squad leader, you know, you say, hey, let's all go do this thing. But meanwhile, they have, the, you know, they have their own lives to lead and their own concerns. I mean, they kind of want to get home for dinner, you know, that kind of thing. And most RPGs, I think, like the moment that stood out to me is you could, you could in, in most RPGs, you're just directing them, like, fight that dragon. I know you're going to probably die, but just do it anyway. You know, whereas here we want you to feel the cost that, uh, of, of like what you're doing to these people. And they, one of the ways we pay that off is them speaking. So this is very similar to my general design philosophy, which is I like to make relatively simple systems, but when you start building them up uh, into how they work together, that's where the complexity takes on. You know, that's where it becomes interesting or emergent is, is what happens when this one's paranoid and this one's virtuous and, you know, all these things are happening together. Because we're dealing with humanity, we wanted to obfuscate or, or hide. We didn't want to tell you exactly what happens. Like, okay, your character's abusive. This is exactly what's going to happen. Instead, we say, OK, you might notice a few things, like we'll give them a, a, a damage boost because they're just really angry. Um, and you'll see that. But you have to kind of observe and see what they do, and eventually, over time, learn, um, learn what the different afflictions do and the different virtues do. And I think that, that joy of discovery through playing, I think, can be really powerful. I, I think also generally good design is you show what's happening, but I think there are times to leave a little bit of it a mystery. And that was like something that, um, actually I'll talk about a little later about the player not always having complete control. 
Oh, in fact, later is now. Loss of agency. <laughs> I think, you know, agency is the term uh, for how much control you have over the game actions in the game world. And we constantly remind you in Darkest Dungeon that you don't have complete control. You can kind of tell them what to do, but sometimes they'll do their own thing. And that can be very, very frustrating, by the way, and, and that's a reason why the game is definitely not for everyone. Interestingly enough, with the affliction system, it's one of the things that actually changed the least during early access. We had, we had about a year in early access. We came to Steam in February of 2015, and then we uh, did full release in January of 2016. And the affliction system is the part of the game that I thought was going to be the riskiest and have the most that we're going to have to fiddle with and maybe not even work, you know, that kind of thing. Oddly enough, it seemed to work really well, and we did, yeah, of all the things we changed in early access, that was, we changed that the least, which is weird. Um, in doing so, though, we succeeded in making the players, players afflicted, as you saw with uh, Ezekiel, who was the streamer at the, at the beginning. And not to be left out is uh, making the game made us afflicted quite often. And so again, affliction is just the term for high stress and maybe not reacting well. So we got to know each other's uh, traits under stress, like who would become irrational, who would become abusive, <laughs> who would become hopeless. Um, and I think you can see that when you're working with, your, you know, on, on teams or whether it's at a game company or frankly anywhere else you, you've worked or even gone to school, you might have a deadline coming up and, you know, there's people that panic. Oh, we're not going to make it. We can't get this done by Friday. I don't know what we're going to do. And then that spreads, right? And like, oh, did you hear? We're not going to make it. Oh, no. Um, and then there's people that are like, no, we're going to get this done. Here's what you're going to do. You're on the table of contents. You research the thing. I'll do this part. Um, we'll get it printed, you know, at, at, at midnight, and we'll turn it in at 8 a.m. And then, whew. So that's kind of the dynamic uh, that happened amongst us as well. And we, we actually got to be where um, we would actually use this game terminology when talking to each other, like we'd say, uh, sorry about what I said, I was afflicted. You know, I, I was stressed out and angry and I feel better now. And that, that was all me. So uh, this is my personal affliction, irrationality. I, I sort of, when it, when it gets really stressful and then I just can't handle any more, then I pick some really small thing to have a giant meltdown about. Um, and then the next day we'll be like, well, that was completely meaningless. Uh, okay, I want to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is how bad design can be really good. Uh, maybe not in this case, though, but I think I remember seeing this picture like 10 years ago. Do you remember it was floating around and it's always stuck with me? I, th I think just the idea that they, they don't look to be in a giant rush to solve the problem always makes me laugh. Um, and, you know, anyways. So a lot of time we're taught you know, this is how you should communicate, this is how you should show things, this is good design, like this is bad design. And of course, it's like any other artistic medium, I believe, that uh, we learn the rules so that we were better educated in ways to break them. <laughs> and I, I think they are made to be broken, it's just that you want to selectively choose when to break the rules. And doing so can, can be risky, but it's also how you can stand out, so I think, um, like this bird, I mean, this bird would be hungry if he obeyed this sign. But uh, no, he ignored the sign, he went fishing anyway. And I think that's kind of what we have to do sometimes. So in this case, for example, the affliction system, um, typically I think loss of player agency is a bad thing. Uh, it can lead to a lot of frustration. You know, I mean, it, it's, you're playing a game because you want to be in control. You don't want to be driving your car um, and then just randomly have the car stop responding to input, unless there's a logical reason, like, okay, it's wet out and I took the curve too fast, and that's a teachable thing, and that's, that's kind of on you. But we have moments at Darkest Dungeon that are not on you, that, that you, uh, you may have made the right decision, but things still will not work out. For example, these are some of the things that the heroes will do when they're afflicted, which can be maddening, especially um, it didn't actually happen in that video, but there have been situations like that where maybe you're about to win the fight and then it comes to the hero who can land the killing blow and they decide not to act because maybe they were paranoid and they say like, ah, and they move to the back and just don't do anything. And then you lose the fight and, uh, you know, it's all because it's not your fault. That hero should have done it. I told him to do it. But if you notice working with people is kind of the same way. 
You know, you say, okay, so you're going to get that done by tomorrow, right? Yes, and then come in tomorrow, what happened? Oh, sorry, I forgot, or whatever. Um, so your heroes are human too. And that, that's, that tagline, it was kind of a marketing tagline that we used, but it was also very much a design uh, guideline. And that, that kind of begs the question of, of uh, there were times in the game's development, and even now, I guess, that there's a tension between like how tactical and, or strategic is this game versus how, how random. Because uh, you know, if things happen outside your control and you made the right move, like you, you make a move in chess and then a little gremlin comes out of nowhere and like switches your pieces around, that would be very frustrating, right? Um, that wouldn't work for chess, but it works for Darkest Dungeon, I guess. So another thing that we did is uh, a very punishing save system, which is to say it auto-saves all the time. And um, so if a hero dies, they're, they're gone. I mean, they're, they're, you can't get them back. Well, except for one town event we added recently, which allows you to resurrect one hero. But that, that's a special case. <laughs> so when something happens, it, it's gone. So that's why he broke his keyboard, right? Because he can't reload the save game and just tackle the boss again. It's not, it's not like he was angry that he you know, lost five minutes. He was angry because he probably lost, well, he lost all those heroes which he had been building up and then he wanted to kill that boss and he lost the time in that quest. So there were, there were very real and permanent consequences. And the reason I, I say bad design, uh, I think permanent consequences are not necessarily bad design, but generally when I'm a game player, I like permissive saves. Uh, I, I want to play the game how I want to play it. Like, why are you going to tell me when I can save and when I can't save? Um, but I found it very interesting when we were talking about this game and designing it that at the end of the day, um, it's about what's right for the game, not, not even about what my philosophy is uh, as a designer. So in order to make Darkest Dungeon work, we really needed it to have permanent consequences and save all the time. And that creates a lot of tension, and every move matters, and even when sometimes things seem to be going well, they can change in a heartbeat, and, and you, you, you can lose things. So that streamer's name was Ezekiel3. So I mean, again, that's, that's what leads to those moments. But those moments, I think, are why the game has been successful, honestly, is just, uh, it's unforgettable, but sometimes in a very bad way. I, there's, when, when new players start playing the game, I, I uh, by the way, how many of you, yeah, have had rage quits on Darkest Dungeon? <laughs> okay, yeah, that's, a, that's like half the people who have played it. Um, on Twitter, we'll kind of see, we follow, I love to just see what people are posting on Twitter, and there's usually, the first couple hours people are in the game, they just love it. You know, they're like impressed by the art style and all these other things and you know, they tweet about just how wonderful it is. And then there's kind of a moment, it's, it's very predictable, where it's like this bullshit RNG, like I brought all the right things and this effing hag like took my character and put him in the pot and I retreated and the character died, whatever. Um, and they threaten to not play the game anymore. And then usually about a day or two later is like a victory post of like, I took down the hag or something like that. So it it's, it's, takes a certain psychology of player to want to engage in this kind of brutal behavior, but, uh, but it, it works. So another thing is there's so much uh, discussion and emphasis on balancing your game really, really well. And one of the things that we said from the very beginning in our heads was, we're not going to try to balance everything perfectly. Now, I want to distingu uh, make a distinguishing, like, it's not that we didn't want the game to make sense or to be able to, you know, it needs to be balanced in its own way, but we didn't want every character class to try to, to be the exact same power. Um, because I think you can end up with really just, everything starts to feel a clone of something else. And, um, you know, in efforts to make it all perfect, you don't have spikes. I remember hearing a talk from the designers of Magic the Gathering, the card game, and one of the things that stood out was, was yeah, it can be okay to have a card that is, is more powerful. You know, sometimes you might have to make tournament rules against it or things like that, but it creates excitement when players get to use that. So during various parts of development, there would be different heroes that were maybe overpowered compared to other heroes. Um, like the Hellion in particular, I think for a while was, was, was significantly overpowered. And so for a while, everybody was rolling Hellions and trying to get Hellions and have Hellions in every party. Uh, the Jester is a character that can reduce stress for the rest of the party. So for a while, it was unbalanced in that the Jester could re 
basically make it so you were never stressed out. So for those couple weeks, like everyone was taking gestures. But that creates like community discussion, it's interesting. And although we did fix those two situations, again, our goal was not to make it so every character is exactly the same. I think the design goal should be every character has a purpose. That purpose might be specific to only some locations, like maybe only in this dungeon or against this boss, this character is really useful. But there's no reason that everybody should be equally useful everywhere. So another piece of bad design, or at least many people on the internet would would tell us it's bad design is our Lord and Savior are in Jesus. <laughs> the random number, you know, the randomness of the game. There's a lot of RNG in Darkest Dungeon, uh, and quite frankly, there has been going back to D and D. You know, you roll a D20, you may fumble, you may have it hit a 20 and a critical. Uh, but at the end of the day, that, that's part of the experience that we wanted to give. You know, again, you could make a great plan and you could have a good army and you go into battle and. Who knows, maybe it rains or your longbows don't work or something like that. So we wanted to bring that in. And at the end of the day, Darkest Dungeon is very analogous to poker, if any of you play poker, uh, because there are right moves to make in poker, but you can still lose. And every, every poker story, every angry poker story is the same story, actually, if you break it down, which is I was winning and I made the right decisions, but then this jerk drew the one card that would save him and then I lost. And there's a little bit of that in Darkest Dungeon. So, and that's by design. And so we, when people say, oh, you know, there's too much variance, things like that, you know, we try to remember that we never want to get rid of all of the variance. So another thing related to the loss of agency is uh, something I want to show you on the final boss. So if you, if you don't want to see the final boss, maybe like close your eyes for three minutes. Um, spoiler alert. <laughs> It'll kick in. There we go. This guy's serious. He's got his notepad. Our creator and our destroy build the heart of the world. Congratulations, congratulations. Let's just the fight begin. Come on to your maker. So it's the enemy's turn right now, and he's trying to figure out why the enemy's not going. Whoa. So when he's mousing over the hero, the hero's basically saying, I'm, I'm ready to die. What are Except for that one says, no, I want to live. <laughs> Some are braver than others. Wait a Although he's a lot calmer than the last, the last guy. Ooh. 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 Yeah, I mean, I would say that's a terrible thing to do. Like, why would anyone do that? But we did it. So I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't say it's a good idea. <laughs> oh, hold on. Uh, make your own judgments on that. Uh, yeah, a little bit on also healing in the game, if you've uh, played it. Most RPGs, you know, you're carrying around lots of health potions. I think this started a long time ago, but certainly got worse with Diablo, the idea that you just carry around potions and they can solve every problem for you immediately, as long as you have enough potions. And in fact, when I played Diablo 3, I feel like the only times I die are just the moments where I couldn't get to the heal button fast enough. Um, and in this case, we specifically designed healing to not keep pace with damage. Like, if you're fighting through a dungeon, you're going to take more damage than you can heal, generally, unless, you know, things are just going really, really well. And a lot of people say, hey, 
you know, love the game, just wanted to let you know, like, the healing's underpowered, but I think aside from that, it's great. And it's like, thank you, and that's exactly what we wanted it to be. We, we don't want you to be able to heal back to full all the time. We want you to be fighting a war of attrition through each quest, where there becomes a point where you say, okay, I've gathered this much treasure, maybe I should get out now while I'm still alive. Because again, if you lose a hero, they're gone permanently. Okay, now I'm gonna skip on to some, uh, some other things and kind of breeze through. I'm gonna just do a random tour of, of stuff in the game. Again, design focused. But I'm also gonna do a, a questions at the end and those can be anything about the game or the, the publishing or the business or Kickstarter, or whatever, whatever you want. Combat um, in our game was definitely inspired by old RPGs. Uh, we knew we were gonna do turn-based and we were a small team, so we, we didn't feel like we could animate. You know, we weren't gonna be able to do Batman combat or um, for that matter, like a Diablo style thing. So we, we looked at games like old gold box uh, D&D where they have keyframes, they just kind of like stand there and then they just go Kah. And that's how we started actually, just like one frame and then hit. And honestly, it's still basically the same. We just kind of tween that and throw effects and shake the screen up and put blood splatters and things like that and try and distract you from the fact that the heroes are animated very simply. They're animated more like Flash. Uh, the combat started as, oops, started as potentially 2D top-down or ISO, like a lot of those classic games, but we ended up doing this, this 1D combat um, where you're just in a line. And there was a lot of questions through development of would there be enough depth in that? You know, could we build a whole RPG around this system? And I uh, just wanted to show you a couple of like evolution of the combat. This was like pretty early when we had this idea, and so uh, Chris was storyboarding, you know, how this might work. And you know, this is when we first got excited about the idea of the, the line on combat. And then, yeah, this was kind of to show the keyframing, like you'll see a pose and then a pose and a hit, and then maybe they comment. So we, were, we thought that, okay, that, there's something there for sure. Then we started working out in more detail how this might work and how the screen would look. And uh, one of the things we hit upon, which is kind of cool, is that, oh, wow, we can we make giant bosses and that'll, that'll look kind of interesting. But we, we ended up restricting to only four slots and four slots. So we never throw like eight at you. We might summon more, do things like that, but um, we, we use that as a design restriction to keep, keep it always to, to four slots. And there was times that I really wanted to or that, that's difficult because it definitely guides your monster design to make sure that, uh, and, and uh, the groups, the monster groups, becomes kind of a, a fun little puzzle to put together. Like, okay, what if we have a stunner and then a healer and a back rank artillery and all that kind of thing. Oh yeah, this was, was more, more art. Uh, this was once we got it up and working and I think we were trying to figure out interface. And then finally, this is representative of the final game. Uh, where you'll see you have your move icons there on the left, and one of the neat things about the combat is that to use a move, you have to be in the right location to use it, and then it'll also sometimes only hit certain enemies, so um, we have ranged attacks, we have melee attacks like that, and so some heroes maybe don't do as much damage, but they're very versatile in where they can be in the order, whereas some, like the leper, is made to be in front. And so if they get shuffled, and there's enemies that can do this that might knock them back or move them around, so if they get shuffled, then they become useless in the back and you've got to waste turns moving up. Let's see, um, another mechanic that be, we had to end up making um, partway through development became really important and is one of my favorite things that's in the game now is, is this concept of death door, which is, because you, you don't always have agency and it's turn-based and sometimes things happen, you can often go from very close to full health to no health before you even have a chance to do anything about it. So this resulted in a lot of frustration, as you might think, because you're sitting there in great shape and then dead. And then it's permanent auto-saving, right? So you're, it, it just was maddening, too maddening. And so we came up with uh, this death door mechanic, which is you can never be killed in one shot. No matter how much damage is done to you, if you had at least one hit point before, then you were re reduced to uh, the death door state, which is, you know, you're at death door, you're about to die. So in this case, like one of our bosses in the game is a cannon and it does shitloads of damage. So, the, but the beauty is, like even, we can dial up the damage like as much as we want, but it still only knocks you down to death door. And then, um, and then you can only be killed while you're at death door. So what happened in that video at the beginning was 
his heroes were at death's door, and then before he could get a chance to move, the necromancer got them both. And I think the great thing about that is it was like a double hit and a double death blow. <laughs> because what happens is when you are at death's door and you get hit, there's still a, a, a greater chance than not that you'll survive. And that, that leads to some really fun moments where your hero may resist uh, dying like five times in a row, and you're just like on the edge of your seed, and you know, it's, it's quite exciting. And when it, for as many times that this happens, when it works and you win, a com you win your first combat after having been at death's door, it, you really get excited. Okay, uh, the narration system. This is our actual, it's funny, I did a Google image search for narration just to throw a quick image in, and our actual narrator came up, which was cool. So it's this guy, Wayne June. Um, Unfortunately, so we have the game translated into eight languages, um, including Czech, including Polish, um, but we haven't translated the narration, the voiceover, we have subtitles. And I think part of that has just been we, we haven't uh, known how to like, we, we just need to source some really good narrators. So I apologize if, if uh, you haven't heard the, the English language narrator, but he, he's, he's pretty amazing. And he came about uh, when we made a trailer to announce the game, actually. This was October of 2013 when we first announced the game. And we did it via trailer. And we made the trailer, and we, we had a narrator in the trailer just because we wanted to tell a little story in the trailer. And he ended up being so good that we wrote him into the whole game. And th that's maybe an example of where we didn't have that planned at the beginning. And I think, wow, if if any of you have heard the narrator or, or kind of the experience, you know, he taunts you the whole time. He, he tells you when you're doing well, when you're doing bad, but there's always a little bit of a sarcastic edge to it. And he is, he actually is your ancestor in the game. So there's a story hook as well. And we found this guy because we were listening to HP Lovecraft audiobooks, and it has, it was just so good and such a perfect match. We said, we need to get somebody like that guy to narrate the game. And then we said, wait, he reads stuff for a living. I wonder if we can get that guy. So we did. Um, it was his first video game, and now he's on Twitter. He loves it. He has like a fan base now. He's, he's hilarious. Um, and a little aside is this is how we, we got our name for the company, which was from the story of horror at Red Hook. I wanted to play just a short selection of the human mind. Narration. Fragile, like a robin's egg. There can be no hope in this hell. No hope at all. Grievous injury. Palpable fear. More dust. More ashes. More disappointment. <laughs> so you see there where he's kind of, even when things are going well, you know, he just, he just never lets, he's like the stern father that you get, you get good grades and, you know, there's no hug. There's like, maybe you just didn't, yeah, there's no frown either, but no hug, clearly. Um, this is one of the famous lines from the game, and, you know, I, I think it's really hard to separate just how much, or to, to overstate how much he's done for the game and make it memorable. Uh, we see people quoting in Reddit threads about things that aren't even our game sometimes. Um, it's, it's really kind of fun. And a little bit of good news, we're making a Dota 2 uh, voiceover pack. And that, so that should be coming um, probably right after the, the Christmas. Okay, now uh, I want to jump into, this is a little bit of, of some of the perils of early access, and so I wanted to do a little quick case study on, on something that we experienced. And I'm using the Dark, dark Knight imagery here for a very good reason. <laughs> uh, so we launched early access February 2015, and quite honestly, everything went better than expected, which is weird in game development. I'm still coming to terms with that. Uh, everyone was pretty positive. I mean, the game had problems for sure, and balance problems and you know bugs galore and things like this. But generally, everyone was pretty happy, which again is weird considering it's the internet. And uh, it was our, our first real chance. Like, we had had stuff in the pipe that we were already planning. and. Um, Actually, the, the next slide will cover it. But this shows that we did updates in early access, and we would typically brand them. We'd give them a name to make it more exciting, and we'd tease them beforehand. We'd always make it a marketing event. Instead of saying, like, Alpha 6 is coming out Friday, you know, we say, like, the corpse and hound, and try to drum up excitement. So we launched early access on February 3rd, and uh, this happened to me, like, six weeks later. So. 
that sucked. Um, there, there's really, yeah, I, I, it sucked, right? And the crazy thing is early access went great. And, you know, it was definitely a high point in my life. Like, we'd been working on this game from nothing, and, and uh, it was already successful, and we could start paying ourselves and things like that. And, you know, and then my dad died, and it was just like that, that took me right out of the updates schedule, as you might expect. I mean, when you're a small team, you know, like I was responsible for the design. So if I'm out of commission, and I was for a good month, really, um, it's hard to make progress in the game. So we could only do so many things. Um, by the way, this is in happier times. This is my dad in his native habitat, which is uh, at, a, at a hamburger joint, which was his favorite, <laughs> called In-N-Out. If you ever go to California, it's, it's, it's very good. Um, but fortunately, we had already planned some stuff. So when I, when I came back from that and started getting back into work, uh, we worked on some stuff that we had already had planned, regardless of kind of how launch had gone. And so really, the Corpse and Hound update, which was in July, was our, our first chance to actually take everything that people were saying and, and try to make some changes. This is that. Um, this actually was that patch before, and one of the things that I threw in there was this concept of heart attacks. We had found that some people would just make all their heroes be afflicted, and they just stopped caring, because like, they could still get enough done that they didn't really care that everyone was stressed out. So we added this, like, okay, you know, if that's how it's going to be, then, uh, you know, added this second. Basically, you fill the stress bar, they become afflicted. If you fill it again, they're just gone. They're dead, which was very in keeping with Darkest Dungeon um, and solved a, a mechanical problem. And, you know, people didn't love it, but, well, some people loved it, but some people didn't love it, but it really didn't cause a giant problem yet. Um, then, then we did this corpse thing as part of the Corpse and Hound, and that's where some of the name for the patch came from. So what we found is uh, that there was a bit of a dominant strategy of just hack on the, the enemy in front and just... Then he dies, then the rest of the enemies collapse forward and just hack on that one, and then they die and just keep going. And although, you know, there was some other stuff going on, it, that was definitely, like, kind of the preferred strategy. Uh, it's kind of the table saw approach to this 1D combat. And uh, so you would just focus everything on them. And if you're familiar with, like, the artillery problem in strategy, that's kind of the same thing. Like, it's generally better to focus fire on one thing rather than spread damage over everything. So there was a number of ways that we could solve this, but uh, the, the way that we came up with, and I honestly think was the best and still is the best, was, was uh, corpses. So when you kill an enemy, they, they turn into a corpse. That's this little jumble of bones. And that preserves the rank for a while. So what you see here is like this situation, there's two archers. So what would have happened before the corpse and hound update is you kill the, the enemy in front and they collapse forward and now the archer can't shoot you because he's, he's too close, because that's the way we designed it. Um, and so now you can attack those dudes in front, but, but they're still back there and they can still shoot you. And the way you can resolve this is either attack the corpse and do damage to it and remove it, or after about two rounds, the corpse will just kind of disappear and then they'll slide forward. So it forces you maybe to move, uh, to use more actions and definitely creates more tension about uh, how to use your moves. You know, it's not always best to focus fire. And at the same time, we, we sort of bumped up the power of some of these guys. Like, so it's really important that archers are very damaging because they may not be back there for very long. Um, so anyway, we were excited. I, I was starting to feel more myself. I wrote like 12 pages of patch notes. It was definitely our longest and most extensive update. And I, we were so excited to deploy this um, patch. So of course it went great, right? Not really. <laughs> this is like me after the patch. Uh, no, people, people lost their minds. Like they, I don't know how else to say it. They lost their minds. And so what happened is our community splintered. There were people that loved it, and there was people that hated it. And not just hated it, they thought, you know, we had killed Mother Teresa, basically. We, you know, we, we were the lowest of the low. Um, they hated it that bad. And that was really hard to see because we had had a really positive community. I mean, there was constructive feedback, and of course, not everybody liked the game. But though, you know, generally the community was quite positive. I mean, Steam forums are always a little crazy, but um, but all of a sudden we we saw the sentiment change from people saying, "Oh, you know, Darkest Dungeon, it's really fun, it's interesting," to like uh, people saying, "You know, they ruined it. They ruined Darkest Dungeon." 
Some people hated it so bad that they started um, review bombing us and vote brigading, and uh, you may have noticed a lot of this is going on, and, and Valve has, um, you know, is doing things to try to curb this. Like, I think I saw like Football Manager um, 2017 or something. It's not translated into Chinese, and so people have vote brigaded it, and now it's down to like a 30% review just because they want the Chinese translation in. Um, so there's people are like weaponizing reviews now. Uh, instead of saying, "Oh no, I actually don't like the game," they're they're just. I want my way, and so I'm going to vote a certain way or get people to vote a certain way. So it's a little rough. But at the same time, there's real feedback in there, right? I mean, not everybody was vote brigading. Some people are just, wow, I don't like this. Thumbs down. It did create, uh, this had already started to happen, but it certainly gelled a small group of people that decided that not only was the corpse thing a bad idea, but um, we were just basically the antichrist as a company. So that was fun. Um, at the same time this all was going on, I was still dealing with, with this. So I, I can honestly say this was a low point not only for me in the game's development, but for the team as well, because uh, it, we had been successful, and that may be hard to understand, like, well, come on, it can't have been that bad because the game was already doing well. But it, it felt like it was going to all be taken away, and that at the end of the day, the, all that might remem be remembered is um, a promising game gone bad. Um, and I think that's the thing, like that, that was a very easy sort of soundbite to say or a story to write would be like a promising game gone bad. So this illustrates kind of just how crazy of a time it was. Uh, Rock, Paper, Shotgun did a feature in July 2015 which was the top 50 role playing games, uh, computer role playing games of all time. And of all time, which was crazy. And they put us in it, which was like amazing and, and I still think is amazing. And this was a little like pull quote from there that you know our game was still in early access and they put us in the top 50 RPGs of all time. Weird. But then we did the Corpse and Hound update. <laughs> and this is one month later. Let's just keep that in context. And there were different people. Like the, the people that put us in the top, you know, it's a website with multiple reporters, et cetera. But I mean, talk about whiplash, right? This, the, like, what? Um, and I, I, I call attention to the word fate because we were, like, we're still making the game, right? Like, how is this a fate? So that's, that was stressful. And, and again, I, I don't want to minimize the feedback because a, a substantial number of people really didn't like it. Um, but I think what we were just like, hard, was hard to, it's hard to take the human emotions out of game development, right? I mean, I, 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 I joked about how we became afflicted during development, but things like this will do it. You know, you're doing something, you're excited, and players hate it. And at the end of the day, though, you have to, you know, you still have to listen to that hard feedback. And this was like something that was hard to understand because up till then, I, I really felt like, the whole point of early access is to change things. I mean, why you're not done development, so isn't that the whole point? And I remember even saying, like I can hear myself saying the line to everyone on the team saying, don't worry, like we're gonna experiment with this, it'll be fine. People might complain about it for a week and then it'll be fine. And also what's the point of early access if you can't change things? So, uh, well I talked a little bit about the sound bite of like, oh, uh, of kind of like, did we ruin the game? I mean, that, that was part of the hard part. You know, some people were playing yesterday having fun, and then they wake up in the morning, and they're no longer having fun, and they had paid us money. So this was a bit of, yeah, like the, the price of making a game that's not for everyone, and we had kind of like avoided that up to that point. But again, you have to listen to that feedback, and you have to separate from like the, the way that's delivered. You know, some people are very hateful, but others are just very constructive about it. Um, we realized that we were not really equipped to manage the community as well as that we had thought. Uh, community management is really easy when your community is just happy. Uh, where it gets hard is when they're not, right? I mean, that's obvious, but... The other thing is change. There was a very popular book like 15 years ago in the corporate role, like Who Moved My Cheese? I don't know if you've heard of this book. Who Moved My Cheese? And it was about how you train rats in a maze with cheese. And you know they do that like you can get them to go faster and faster. You can teach them a maze. Then you move their cheese, and then they're like, "Oh shit, I don't know where to go," or that you know, or, or you move the the ending point, and now the rat doesn't know what's going on. And so this was like popular about like change management effectively. And 
one example I have in the game is, we, this is during development before we went to early access. Uh, if you played the game, we add a little bit of a camera shift. So it's, it's 2D basically, but we add a little bit of a shift like when it's your turn and then the enemy's turn and we do this like pivot camera. And when we put that in about like partway through development, one of the people on the team, like the, the other artist actually said, he was so mad, he's just like, this is the worst fucking thing I've seen in my entire life. That, those were the verbatim words that he said. Um, about a week or two later, he said, I like it. And we didn't change anything in the interim, maybe a little bit of tuning. And the point is just, uh, you know, it can be a shock to change things, right? So there's lots of things that you can do to help make change more manageable. Tell people it's coming, do it in a private beta branch, like all these things that we should have done, but we didn't. But we were faced with this dilemma of like, do we take corpses back out of the game? And you know, we talked and talked and talked. And we believed they were the right mechanic for the game. And so we had this dilemma of, do we make the game worse to make the community happy? Um, what ended up, yeah, what ended up happening is, no, we, we followed the vision of the game, which was, okay, you know, it needs to be hard, it needs to be tactical, it needs to all these sorts of things. Um, we invested in, in a full-time community manager, thank God. Uh, we added a toggle option. This was something that, that there was a lot of internal debate on, but what really got me in the end was people that said, I was having fun yesterday, I'm not having fun today. And we had already taken their money, and I felt like that, that was tough. So we put an option to turn off corpses. It remains in the game, actually. And only about, I mean, this, it's been a while since I pulled the data, but only about maybe 10% of players had, had toggled them off. Um, and so that shows that a lot of people liked it. It's just that there was a very vocal... Um, minority, and had we changed everything for them, then we'd have the problem of 90% of the people being angry again, right? Um, you, so you can't please everyone, and I think that that's a really, really tough thing, uh, but something you have to constantly live with. And that's where the vision comes in again, because if you don't set out to please everyone, that's okay. You should please your, your core. Okay, I'm going to uh, wrap it up in a minute, so we have a few minutes for questions, so I'm going to have to skip a, a couple things, but... We did eventually uh, improve the presentation of the, of the corpses, and, um, messed with a few other things. When we eventually came out, people liked it. In fact, some of the people that had said, well, I don't know, and had written write-ups like some press that had said, I think this is a misstep, um, actually came in the end and, and said it was good. So, you know, it, it can be tough to weather those storms. And I think there's a little bit, the reason I use the Dark Knight thing is uh, things have been going so well that I think there was just a point where um, we needed to, yeah, w w something, we were going to make a mistake. I mean, we make mistakes all the time, it's just they hadn't been found, I guess. So the learnings there are that um, early access content is always good, uh, but substantive gameplay changes are rough, and so my advice to you would be really delay as long as possible. Because, yeah, you can do things to minimize the change, but at the end of the day, if we had launched with corpses at early access, I don't think we would have had the problem. I think it was just too much of a change. Okay, yeah, I gotta wrap it up. Um, yeah, I was running a timer. We started late because of the uh, adapters and whatnot. So apologies, um, yeah, a few takeaways. I, I don't know if we have. <laughs> anyway, this is how you can reach me. I'm happy to field questions or talk to you after the show, so. All right. Oh, also, thank you very much for inviting me to Prague. It's, it's an honor, for sure. Thank you very much. Oh, 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 yeah. Thank you very much, Tyler. <laughs> but uh, we have a time because I feel like a traitor right now. So don't put it off. Don't put it off. We have a time for two questions, all right? So there is a time and space for two questions. There is one, and here is another one. So only those two questions, please. And if you want to ask Tyler something else, you can do it right after, after he gets down. <laughs> I don't know if it's switch on. Oh. Uh, hi, uh, I've got a question. Did you use uh, any analytics tools to grab feedback, or did you grab feedback only directly from uh, Steam forums? Uh, good question. The question about analytics, we did, actually. We hooked into some analytics, some telemetry, and that was really, really important to try to separate the emotion from, uh, you know, 
the emotional delivery from the actual. So we could look at things like uh, what characters people were using and deaths and who turned on the corpse, who turned off the corpse option. Um, that, that helped a lot because people say, oh, the Hellion's overpowered, and then we'd see that maybe she's still underused. So yes, we did. And there's a lot of good free solutions for that. We happen to uh, use a partner's solution, Clay. They do like don't starve, things like that. But, um, but there's lots of good cheap analytics out there. OK, thanks. OK, uh, you, you said that uh, you had quite a bit of time uh, before the production. So what was like the pre-production time for you? It's, it's hard to say exactly um, because we were working other jobs, but I would say actually between when we first had the idea for the game and when we started the company was about two years. Um, but that wasn't working on it for two years. It was like once a month getting together for beers and talking about it. So uh, I would say it's probably the equivalent of a, of a couple months of like really like thinking about it and diagramming before like breaking code. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ricky.